Tonight we'll be using as a springboard the new interpretation, which is 595 in the first edition and 640 in the second edition. And before we get to that, it's that the idea of, of purpose is the, the very thing that we're going for in the sense that forgiveness or salvation or atonement, you could call it by many different names, is the purpose. There's a different purpose for this world, and it's just very obscure and buried. Because when the mind falls asleep, it thinks of purposes in terms of specifics. What's the purpose of a house? What's the purpose of a pencil? What's the purpose of shoes? You know, everything seems to have a purpose. And, and when you really start to look at it, the purpose usually always comes back to the body, how it relates to the body in some way. You know, streets and cities and everything that they, the purpose, you could say, well, the reason cities grew up seems because they were near waterways and interstates and so on and so forth, and they seemed to have an economic function or whatever, and again, that purpose is based on economic, well, what's the economic system based on? Well, for support of human life, you know, it goes back to that body identification. Another thing about purpose to me too is purpose that we're trying to come to is not natural. Just like forgiveness isn't natural, that the mind when it fell asleep and learned a false world, you have to very carefully unlearn the world and you have to learn, very carefully learn a new purpose. Because this purpose that we're talking about is not, is not, there is no purpose as such in the kingdom of heaven. There's just being. <laughs> you know, purpose is kind of like a goal. And in the kingdom of heaven, there are no purposes. So it only came into play with the seeming separation, just like forgiveness came into play with the seeming separation. Yeah. In truth, there's no forgiveness. In truth, there's no purpose. Right. The atonement, you could say, there was no need for an atonement or a correction. There is no need for atonement and correction in heaven. So to talk about a single purpose, we're talking about the realm of heaven. So. I'm using the term heaven is natural. <laughs> heaven is natural. When the mind fell asleep, that was very unnatural. And now it has to learn a very unnatural correction in the sense that that this is kind of like the needle in the haystack. The mind fell asleep, it found itself in the haystack, and now it's got to find the needle. And to find the needle, it has to question every straw <laughs> in the haystack. You know, it, it has to be a very thorough. thorough going through. You can't just kind of go, kind of by chance, to stick your hand in there and hope to pull the needle out. So that's why it's so important that we really keep coming together and look at what are all the obstacles and the um, blocks to coming to awareness of that purpose. But it's, it's going to have to be very carefully learned. So the section here, the new interpretation, it's going to talk about purpose in the sense that there's a line, I think, in this section that says, only a constant purpose can endow events with stable meaning. In the sense that once the mind falls asleep, it's perceiving all these images and it's very distorted. And instead of having a single unified purpose, it's got millions of purposes. It's everything that is perceived seems to have a different purpose. This book seems to have a different purpose than that microphone. This shoe seems to have a different purpose than this couch. A table seems to have a little bit different purpose than a chair, for example. An airplane has a different purpose than a bus. You know, it, everything seems to have meaning in and of itself. And Jesus even addresses it in the, the workbook where he says, 
at the most superficial levels, you think you know what purpose is. He uses the example of a telephone. He says, you think that a telephone is for reaching someone that's not in your proximity. Seems to be the purpose of a telephone, but Jesus says that's not a, a real purpose. That there really is no purpose at superficial levels. The real question is, what do you want to reach him for? You see, it's one thing to, to call somebody up on the phone, but, but what's my purpose for reaching them? What is this for? And he says, now there you're getting, you're getting down to the mind level. That is a decision of mind. What's my purpose in reaching my brother? As opposed to like you mean supervision. like right now I'm trying to reach my children because I'm worried. See, I want to know how they're doing. I'm not able to reach them. But if I wanted to call somebody just to gossip about somebody, then that what that's the purpose. What's my purpose? Yeah. Here? Well, even the idea of concern too. If you bring it back to real simple terms, Jesus says, "Teach only love, for that is what you are." So again, whether it's making a phone call, going to visit someone, doing anything. It's, it's asking, and it's being tuned in to the Holy Spirit and saying, Holy Spirit, you know, what would you have me say? What would you have me do? That came up in one of your lessons recently. That's the, that's the kind of purpose. And then it may take the form of a phone call. But really, it's my intention. It's another word for purpose. What's my intention here? Am I calling to um, pull out the hooks and try to make somebody guilty? Am I calling to manipulate somebody to get them to do something that I want them to do? Or is my or how purpose? I feel when I call and call and call and they're not there. I feel scared. I feel weary. Yeah. So we're back to another good question. It, it's that question of purpose. If, if the Holy Spirit has a purpose and, and if I line up with His purpose and I feel peace, then I want to learn what that purpose is. Because it doesn't feel good to feel scared. You know, it's uncomfortable. Fear would not be coming from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. So, that must be a wrong-minded purpose mm -hmm. for which I'm making the call. For so why I'm making the call? To be scared and fearful? Well, it must be a wrong-minded purpose. Because you're at home? No, because you're feeling fearful. You can tell by how you feel that the purpose behind your call must be coming from the wrong mind and not from the right mind. Because when it comes from the right mind, you feel at peace. So I could, so from them not answering the phone, I could, well, I think this too. On the other hand, it's they're probably out to the lake. They're fine. They're having fun. I'm at peace with that. So where does the fear come from? And my next thought might be, hope nothing happened. Hope everything's okay. But I'm like, oh, or okay, fine. Then, and then I get scared. Oh, is it maybe they lost the phone number here, and and they're trying to reach me, and they can't reach me. And oh no, they're they're fine. They're fine. There's a lesson in the course about. Um, My holiness blesses the world. It's one of the lessons on holiness where um, he basically asks you to put in specific, even specific persons. It's kind of springing from what Anita was just saying about concern about the children and how they're doing. Lesson 38 is a real um, practical one for, for dealing with concern about you know, how people are doing. And the, the lesson is, Lesson 38, titled, There is Nothing My Holiness Cannot Do. And the first paragraph it just says, Your holiness reverses all the laws of the world. It is beyond every restriction of time, space, distance, and limits of any kind. Your holiness is totally unlimited in its power because it establishes you as the Son of God, at one with the mind of His Creator. And the specific applications in italics, which are down a little lower, are the ones that really come in handy. And the, the way it reads is it says, In the situation involving blank, in which I see myself, there is nothing that my holiness cannot do. 
to put your own name in there in the sense of thinking of myself I'm of calling home and not getting any answer and feeling fearful.